All right. Yeah. Thanks for that introduction, Jeff. So at this point, I'm just going to open it up to the participants. So people can come in, make a point, or ask a question. So I've got, yeah, I've got most people on camera except for John. So if you just indicate with your hand, and John, if you can just send me a message uh, if you want to I'd speak. Here, can you see my? Do you see my? Does my screen light up when I? No. Uh, it lights up when you speak. Yeah. Uh, wave, does it light when I wave my hand? No. <laughs> okay, I'll send you a text. <laughs> All right, so does anyone want to come in? Yeah, Dave? You need it uh, on mute. No, you need to on mute. Yeah, that's it. Is that okay? That's it. Yeah, Jeff, hi, we did meet once. Uh, I'm a big comrade of uh, Kostas Skordoulis, Octe Spartakos in Greece. Um, I've actually got to go. My food has arrived, uh, which is a great shame because I presumably this is going to be on Facebook or and you're going to publish this in your newspaper. We'll put a video up on our, our YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel? Yeah. Um, could you put the YouTube channel so I can get that by simply doing YouTube socialist action? Socialist uh, democracy. It's hosted. It's hosted. It's hosted by socialist democracy, so it'll be on our YouTube channel. Oh, so it'll be on socialist democracy. Yeah, I worked with some SD comrades when I was in Limerick, um, three, four years ago, uh, ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got to go, but I'll just say one thing. It's. Um, in England, it's a huge problem. I mean, I'm a member of the Fourth International and actually within the opposition, the left opposition within that organisation, because the British socialist resistance is very reformist, whereas Up Day Spartacos is, uh, is, is revolutionary. Um, a problem is that in England, thus far, we still have 100 or 200,000 of the best class conscious comrades inside the Labour Party. Now, we're gradually getting expelled, as you know. I'm astonished I haven't been expelled, but many of my comrades have. And a couple of, and that must be 100,000 people have left because of the rightward march of Labour. I mean, Starmer is not going to be as right wing as Biden, but he's going to be as right wing as Tony Blair. So the problem is well, I'm in a group called Labour Left Alliance not to be confused with United Left Alliance in Ireland. And Labour Left Alliance, I'm there because it tries to work with comrades, class conscious comrades inside the Labour Party, but also a pole of attraction for those outside as a non-sectarian, uh, non-democratic centralist uh, or <coughs> group. Um, but I guess, so uh, the problem for me and other comrades in the Labour Left Alliance is is, uh, and you can't answer this, uh, I suppose, but um, is when to leave and if to leave. I mean, um, we know the history of reformism, you know, Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, uh, all their writings on it. Uh, but uh, England or well, Britain is, is England or Wales, a bit different than the States in that there is a, a cadre, cadre is too strong a word, a number, 100,000, people who are either socialist or Marxist, or at least, I'm going to stop in a minute, uh, or at least very left social democrat, who are moving leftwards. Um, so my personal problem is, is about staying in Labour as well as preparing for a, hopefully an organised, disciplined, mass split from Labour, which is, which is what I'm working for. All right, thanks for that. Um... Anyone else want to come in? Just indicate with your hand or, or speak. Did you want me to comment on that? Yeah, you can come back on anything. That's, if you want to come back on the points that are raised, yes. Okay. I'll wait. Um, Chris? Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, hello, Jeff. Um, yes. Uh, Nice to hear your uh, talk on your experiences. Um, just at the end of your presentation, <clears throat> you mentioned that the perspective of um, socialist action is uh, to fight for the establishment of a, a 
the US Labour Party is based on democratised and fighting unions. Now, um, my question to you is, is there any evidence that there is life in the, the trade unions or are the trade unions, even down to local level, as bureaucratised as they are here? What chances do you think there is for uh, developments within uh, the labour unions? <coughs> Want to come back, Jeff? Well, I deeply appreciate that question. Um, and I have an unusual answer. Right now, the state of the American trade union movement is lower and worse than at any time in the modern era. Public employee unions do represent 36% of the working class, and the private sector is virtually non union. The president of the AFL-CIO, the former mine worker president, Richard Trumka, has meetings with uh, President Trump and are tied 100%, not 99, to the Democratic Party. There isn't a single union in the United States, aside from occasional paper resolution, that has any perspective of breaking with the Democratic Party. But having said that, I would say this, prior to the murder of George Floyd, no one in the United States expected the unprecedented massive mobilizations that we saw. They seemed to come out of nowhere, but in truth, they came out of the contradiction. And that is the deep anger and frustration that working people feel at the infringements on every aspect of their lives. Huge numbers, 50 million people have lost their jobs during this pandemic. But even before that, despite the government touting the idea that we had the lowest unemployment rate in the modern era at 3.5%, the truth is that that was, like you have in England, a rigged figure the actual labor participation rate in the United States prior to the pandemic was 35%. That is 35% of the eligible workers basically had no jobs. But because of the statistical manipulations of the uh, labor uh, board, the, the portrait of a fully employed um, uh, workforce was constantly put forward. Working people are suffering as never before. The massive shift of wealth between the rich and poor is unprecedented in the United States. We have a class of billionaires with a stock market at an all time high or close to it on the one hand and massive impoverishment, massive job losses, especially women, uh, they're the first and black women even more because of the pandemic and the discrimination and the differential in wages and the relegation of women to the low wage economy. So just as we saw a massive emergence of independent forms of struggle in the streets, United Front style in the black community and their allies, <clears throat> we don't rule out that the contradiction today between the low level of organization of the American working class <clears throat> and what's possible tomorrow could break out in ways that are unprecedented. And I mean it. I think that there's going to be a combination of events. There's going to be inevitably a class struggle left wing in the existing unions. There's at the same time going to be major efforts to form brand new unions that break with the bureaucracy, which is the case uh, with the formation of the CIO in the 1930s, the break with the AFL. I think that class struggle fighters are going to find their way to rebuild the unions, and they're going to be independent unions. Today, it's inconceivable for anyone to imagine a resurgence of the American trade union movement that is separate and apart from a fighting trade union movement in the streets. 
<clears throat> that is, if we're going to have a real labor party in the United States based on the class, based on fighting unions, it's going to come out of real struggles. It's going to come out of major strikes led by class struggle fighters that win and force the bosses at the point of production to back off. That kind of inspiration, like we saw with the massive mobilizations after George Floyd's murder, should be, in our opinion, expected. In other words, this massive anger of the American working class is going to find a way, in our view, to have a organizational and political expression at the point of production in the streets, in alliance with the social movements, and in the formation of a brand new party, a labor party. A labor party, in my view, is inconceivable. In this regard, if I may make a comment as an outsider to your comrades, we see in the United States, as we do in Canada with the NDP, the labor party there, basically the labor party organized as an electoral vehicle, but largely separate and apart from an instrument of working people in the streets to fight for the day-to-day -day issues of working people. In my opinion, a serious revitalization of the British Labour Party or the perspective of a left-wing split has to be inseparable from United Front mass actions in the streets to challenge capitalist austerity in all of its manifestations. You're not going to have a cold Labour Party or an internal reform as hopeful as we were in Jeremy Corbyn, that is separate, apart from, and not connected to the organic mobilization of working people in the streets to close it down. So that's our perspective in the United States. We're optimistic that working people are going to find a way to, uh, for new organizations, to a reconstruction of the labor movement, to a rebuilding and uh, and ousting of the present bureaucracy in alliance with class struggle fighters at the point of production. That's the future of our country. The basic thing your uh, comrades should understand, in my view, is that the United States is not some kind of right-wing exceptional phenomena representative of Trump. There are tens of millions of working people who are anti-racist. One poll by CNN, which is our you know, uh, news agency said that 84% of the entire American population supported the Black Lives Matter mobilizations. There is a deep democratic spirit running through the American people. They lack a leadership in the trade unions, in the black community. The Democratic Party is the traditional institution, the graveyard of social movements. And it works day and night to orient the entire movement back into its reformist channels using Bernie Sanders type politicians or the uh, religious community or the myriad unprecedented number of corporate funded NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So in answer to your question, yes, we think that out of nowhere, which in truth means out of the anger and frustration of tens of millions of working people, there will be a fundamental break with reformist politics, the formation of fighting working class organizations, including a labor party based on a fighting reinvigorated trade union movement in alliance with all the oppressed and exploited. We're optimistic for the future. That's why we're running this presidential candidate, not because we can win, but because it gives us an opportunity to talk directly to meet the future class struggle fighters to build the social movements that we are engaged in every day. Right. So just anyone who wants to come in, ask a question or make a point, just indicate with your hand and join <coughs> you. You can, because you're not on camera, just speak. Uh, hello. <laughs> yep, here you. Okay. Sorry, sorry, you can't see me. Uh, 
Listen, before I start, Jeff, you're speaking to the Irish, just in case you think you're speaking to the English. Absolutely, and my apologies. My <laughs> deep apologies for that stupid... There were some, there were some English comrades present. <laughs> right. uh, in, in that theme, uh, I would like to say that there's an issue coming up, uh, an immediate issue, which we'll be in communication with you about, but a Dr. Hawaji, of, uh, a Palestinian, was the subject of an MI5 sting operation, along with some a group of Republicans, and has been arrested uh, and charged with conspiracy. Uh, uh, the outcome of this arrest was he was taken to hospital for medical attention and on the grounds of, co of COVID, he has been thrown into solitary confinement and not allowed to join the Republican prisoners in, uh, in uh, Mugabe jail. So he's gone on hunger strike. Uh, uh, the, Repu the entire Republican uh, prisoner population of Mugabe have gone on hunger strike with him. And uh, a number of Republicans are having um, protest hunger strikes uh, outside and there's a series of demonstrations. So uh, we'll probably, we'll be writing an article on this and we'd probably send you details, uh, you know, because people tend to dismiss uh, ill treatment of Republican prisoners in Ireland. But the fact that uh, this man is a Palestinian uh, to a certain extent highlights the brutal treatment that prisoners do receive at the moment. So that's, that's just one issue I'm telling you about. Now, more generally, um, I would like to know what you think of the the people who fell in behind Sanders, because uh, I would say, on the one hand, my own feeling is that you welcome that. Here's people that weren't in politics, uh, and uh, they, being na naive, they saw Bernie Sanders as the socialist politician, and they flocked to support him. And as a result, many of them have been drawn into the Democratic Party, but their initial uh, impetus was a good one. Uh, I think we should welcome the initial movement to the left of that, that youth layer. On the other hand, there are left politicians, uh, a left leadership who are already there, and uh, I think they have proved to be a serious obstacle to uh, young people developing further to the left. So I'd like to see what you think about that. Do you want to come directly back to that, Jeff? Yes. First, embarrassed, my deepest apologies in my terrible slip in not directing my remarks to the Irish people and Irish comrades. Uh, I don't know if you can ever forgive me for that. No, we're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, second, um, on the question of Palestine, you can add Socialist Action USA to any defense efforts in defense of this uh, Palestinian prisoner. Um, we are in total solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. And we are appalled and disgusted at the uh, Trump administration's proclamations that he has brought peace to Palestine, Israel by uh, reestablishing relations with Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates uh, without any consultation with the Palestinian people. It's just an example. Uh, our view is we are for a democratic secular Palestine, that is the original Palestine with the right of return of the hundreds of thousands of people, Palestinians who were driven from their homeland. 
we do not recognize the legitimacy of the state of Israel. We see it as no different from a settler colonial state in the same way that Irish militants don't recognize the legitimacy of British rule in Northern Ireland or anywhere else in the world in any of the other British colonies which today are being recolonized and integrated into the imperialist world. So um, this is just an opportunity for us to state our solidarity with the Palestinian cause. And I will also note when the millions in the streets went out for George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, the Palestinians were in those demonstrations with their own banners expressing their solidarity. So count on us in the United States, send us an article and we'll publish it in the paper and know that the situation facing Palestinian prisoners, if not Irish political prisoners, parallels that that we see in the United States. The vast number of political prisoners in the United States are blocked. We play a leading national role, for example, in defense of the black Philadelphia innocent political prisoner after, who has been in prison almost 40 years, Mumia Abu Jamal. We led massive demonstrations for Mumia's freedom that mobilized 50,000 people, 25,000 each in Philadelphia and San Francisco. We fight for the freedom of all political prisoners. But let me expand on that. We are not only for the freedom of those who are, quote, political prisoners. We are for ending the entire racist, classist prison industrial complex, where prisoners are sent to jail to work in the increasingly privatized prison system at an average wage of 50 cents an hour for Fortune 500 corporations. That is, we see in the modern day US prisons a return to near slave-like positions, uh, conditions. Why should any self-respecting monopoly corporation hire for farm labor a Latino from Mexico when they can have a prisoner for 50 cents an hour? That's the horror of the prison industrial complex. So I totally agree with you on that question. And now on Bernie Sanders. <clears throat> we know Bernie Sanders for decades. He is an independent senator, but in his home state, Vermont, everyone knows that if you run a Democrat against Bernie Sanders, the wrath of the Democratic Party if not in its time, the Obama administration will come down on you. The Obama administration and the Democrats only fund Bernie Sanders in Vermont and never the opposition or even the so-called left-wing Democrats. Yes, John, it is absolutely true that Bernie Sanders stating that he was for a political revolution and socialist democracy did inspire many, many young people to be interested in socialist ideas. They had, however, the illusion that, during, that the Democratic Party could be reformed, and that is from the left wing of it. And there has never been a left wing of a capitalist party in the United States. There are no working class forces that operate inside the Democratic Party. It is entirely funded and controlled by billionaires, as Bernie Sanders learned to his shock when it turned out that the billionaires joined in supporting Joe Biden for president to defeat and red bait Bernie Sanders. So yes, we owe a debt of gratitude for Bernie Sanders, but only because he gave voice to the huge numbers of young people in particular, who see the Democratic Party as the ruling class party, but who had illusions because they're newcomers that this Democratic Party could be reformed. Bernie Sanders supported uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016 
and now he's campaigning for Joe Biden and the entire Democratic Party slate. This has led to disarray in organizations. So for example, the DSA, a relatively new organization in the modern era, the DSA has been around for Democrat for, for decades, uh, passed a resolution saying only Bernie Sanders for president. Much of the left has disintegrated, dissolved their parties like the ISO that claimed 2,000 members in the United States ended up dissolving itself with a majority joining DSA and supporting the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign and now the Biden campaign. The same thing with Socialist Alternative that came out of the UK formation, the Grant Wood tendency. They are now moved into DSA and Bernie Sanders. A terrible tragedy, a sign of disintegration and disorientation of important sections of the former left in the United States. So yes, we are friendly to the Bernie Sanders young people who today believe that the Democrats have to be supported in order to keep the quote, fascist Trump out of power. But our method is not to denounce the DSAers or the Bernie Sanders supporters, but rather to pose to them the idea of unity in action, of united front massive democratic protests to challenge all the evils of capitalism, to mobilize against imperialist war and the US war machine, its wars against the Iranians, the Venezuelans, the Syrians, and indeed the US maintains almost 1,000 military bases around the world. Our view is out now. We built an anti-war movement based on the right of oppressed nations to self-determination. We demand bring the troops home now. Self-determination for poor and oppressed nations. Bring the troops home now. That's our strategy, to work directly with Bernie Sanders supporters in the streets in defense of black lives, in defense of Mumia, in defense of the environment, but in a manner independent of the Democratic and Republican parties. The Sanders machine is an electoral machine. It's designed to raise millions of dollars to elect Democrats. In 2016, the Bernie Sanders left wing Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez supported the full spectrum of Democrats. Everyone from right wing, blue dog Democrats, segregationist Democrats to so-called Northern liberal Democrats. Our view is break with the Democratic Party, but we're not a sterile party of denunciation. We're a party of the United Front of massive actions. Our history is to mobilize broad united coalitions against all of the evils of capitalism and the best fighters in those struggles will be won to our party and break from democratic party reformism so yes we don't run around denouncing dsa there are many wonderful comrades in it and there are many wonderful young people initially attracted to the ideas of bernie sanders and they are becoming disillusioned with the Democrats, including Sanders' support to the racist Joe Biden, who Sanders ran against in the primaries and exposed many of his fundamentally capitalist, imperialist policies. Can I just ask the question? Just you mentioned this, the Sanders campaign. I seem to have some initial success in the early rounds of the primaries. But when he ran into uh, North Carolina, it was sort of a, a major setback, which he didn't recover from. And it seemed that like identity politics played a part there with uh, sort of prominent black uh, congressman endorsing Biden. It seemed to sort of hold sway with a lot of the, the black people, the black people who voted in that uh, primary election, given overwhelming majority to Biden and set him on his way to the nomination. So what role does identity politics play in US politics and left politics in terms of race, and in terms of uh, also there's claims against, uh, these persistent claims against Sanders supporters that they were sexist, Bernie bros, um, 
claims, you know, we've seen claims in, uh, in Britain against uh, Corbyn, you know, that he was an anti-Semite, that he was a racist, you know, we've had these claims that people are sort of smeared with these, with these accusations of being transphobic, of being homophobic, and seem to, they seem to cause confusion amongst the left for, for, for whatever reason, so I fall for these uh, smears very easily. Good question. Um, yes, everybody in the United States followed the primaries of the Democratic Party. And uh, when it became clear to the ruling class of America and the Democratic Party establishment that Sanders posed a serious threat uh, they shifted gears and united the entire corporate Democratic Party to sink Sanders' ship. Interestingly, it was led by a black uh, clergyman, congressman, and the entourage around him. Okay. But it was aimed at saying, at, at mobilizing this very significant section of the black population that is influenced by the church, which is funded by the Democratic Party in order to channel literally millions and millions of black people into reformist channels. That's what the Democratic Party is. They are the, quote, left wing of the ruling class. And I say, quote, but I can tell you, for example, in Oakland, how many black churches with congregations of 5,000 people get funded by the Democratic Party. Their preachers or ministers are receive grants of hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a new wing or to run a private school uh, or to run a charter school uh, uh, that breaks with public education in order to fund them. We have a huge apparatus of black politicians in the United States who basically sell their souls and their congregations. And it's the same thing with the Latino churches, the Catholic churches uh, of the Latino community often are organizers for the Democratic Party and channel their rank and file into the Democratic Party. And the same thing with the literally tens of thousands of NGOs. Would you believe that in the San Francisco Bay Area alone, for example, we have 500 NGOs that work on the environment, all funded by corporate elites, which have no interest in defending the environment. So the, the full force press, when you have like the mayor, former mayor of San Francisco, uh, of uh, New York, Bloomberg, contributing hundreds of millions of dollars to the Sanders campaign, and a California billionaire who uh, ran for office, who made part of his fortune on investing in the construction of prisons to house black people at a profit for chief labor. He was a supporter of the anti-Sanders campaign. So you saw a full court press of all the corporate media in the country, all the billionaires, all the control they have over the media, unsatisfied with Bernie Sanders as their candidate because even the most minimal of Sanders' ideas are unacceptable to the ruling class. So they blasted him out of the water and tragically in the name of using black politicians, which they have always done uh, in the Democratic Party to hurl reactionary uh, uh, epithets against Sanders. But I tell you, as the American candidate, I carefully watched the debates between Sanders and Biden. And it was amazing. When Joe Biden went after Bernie Sanders for going to Nicaragua uh, or for opposing US intervention in Cuba or for supporting dictatorships, Bernie Sanders was silent before millions of people on national TV. He could have said, the United States supported the death squad Somoza government that killed 80,000 people. It supported the Batista government that murdered 50,000 people under the US-backed dictatorship. He didn't 
say a word because he was afraid to be labeled as a supporter of the right of self-determination of Nicaragua or El Salvador or Grenada. He stood silent and smiled. And the same thing with regard to Joe Biden and racism. He let him off the hook. He had the national stage and he decided to tack right and liberal, bump elbows with Joe Biden, declare that Joe Biden was his friend. Joe, Fra Joe Biden is no friend of the socialist movement, of working people, of black people, or anywhere else. But Bernie Sanders let him off the hook. He appeared as an innocuous politician, and the fact check record demonstrated that Biden got away with one lie after another on national TV, and Bernie Sanders didn't hold him accountable. So that's what American politics are about. Yes, we're aware of what they did to Jeremy Corbyn. They threw the anti-Semite label, confusing or con con uh, uh, conflating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And from what I understand, the comrades in the UK and elsewhere let, uh, let them get away with it, acceded to the idea that Corbyn was an anti-Semite, absolutely uh, a reactionary position. We rejected any of these slurs and lies against the Corbyn campaign. But the Corbyn campaign was basically electoral. That's our fundamental criticism. And that is it was based on getting out the vote for the Labour Party machine, mm -hmm. the internal machine that's controlled by the right wing. A real revival, and this is our opinion from far away, forgive us Irish comrades, that a serious Labour Party can only be built in the UK or anywhere else in the world if it's a fighting Labour Party that defends the interests of working people. That's why we saw the horror in working class areas of people who had been Labour Party supporters for decades vote conservative. They did so because they believed they had, they did not see the presence in their everyday lives of the Labour Party defending their interests. And they acceded to the base reactionary anti-immigrant and racist propaganda because the Labour Party allowed them to blame the fate of working people on the Labour Party or on immigrants and get away scot-free. We can only break working people from the notion that immigrants or blacks or others are their enemy by uniting in the streets with the oppressed. That's the example of the Black Lives Matter movement. They broke down racist stereotypes and prejudice more in a matter of days than in hundreds of years in the United States. When people saw courageous blacks united with young whites in the streets, they identified with that struggle. They identified with the idea that the United States is a nation of systemic racism that is inseparable from the slaveocracy of the past, that the entire country is permeated with racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, gender prejudiced uh, bigots who run this country. People's consciousness changes as they engage in struggle, not just as they read newspapers or go to the polls. Struggle unites people. It evaporates the differences that they see. That's what we saw with Black Lives Matter. That's what we will see in all future struggles. The best of humanity, humanity comes out when working people join together to fight the common enemy, the ruling class. And the ruling class in the United States, if not the UK and Ireland, has never been more thoroughly exposed in modern history incapable of dealing with a crisis-ridden world capitalist economy, with a pandemic that is taking the lives of millions, of hundreds of thousands. By December in the United States, it's expected that the number of deaths will double from 200,000 to 400,000 by the end of the year. Not to mention 
a crisis of racism, not to mention an environmental crisis, an economic crisis. People will find their way into the streets and the best fighters in the socialist movement will be leading these united front mass actions and challenging the Bernie Sanders supporters, not to mention the trade unions and everyone else to join them in the streets to defend common working class interests. All right, I have a couple of indications. Uh, first one from Garroj. Yeah, hello, Jeff. Um, I have two questions, really. Uh, the first one is, you seem to have a non-sectarian attitude towards Bernie Sanders' base, so to speak, the young people who are drawn into his campaign. I presume that extends to some extent also to the base of people like uh, Ocasio Cortez or the base of uh, Ilan Omar. And my question is really um, between these people, <clears throat> because they're quite individualistic um, representations, are there any significant differences between the likes of Sanders, Ocasio Cortez, and Ilan Omar? One of the reasons I ask about Ilan Omar is because um, I'm actually I'm an Irish comrade, but I'm, I'm living here in Colombia now for 15 years. Um, Ilan Omar got quite a lot of positive press com coverage here because she challenged Elliot Abrams over the US record in El Salvador when he was being proposed as sort of like the new head honcho to deal with Venezuela. She got quite a lot of uh, positive coverage here. And the question is, is, well, is there any difference between Sanders Ocasio-Cortez and Neil and Omer? And more importantly, is there any difference between their bases um, in terms of socialist politics? That's the first question. It's a bit long. And the other question is, and this is looking at it from the outside, and uh, Jonathan mentioned the whole question of identity politics. You sort of get the impression uh, and this is something that has spread out all around the world, but it's spread out in the United States. You sort of get the impression, though, that most of the left in the United States is not actually really willing to make any sort of criticism of identity politics or even identitarians themselves. Um, you know, they seem to get a free ride, not only in the, <clears throat> in the bourgeois press, but also in the left press. And so somebody like Tani Hesey Coates, you don't get huge criticisms of them from the left. It falls to someone like Colonel West to criticize them. Um, it seems to be that the left, the far left, sort of, um, it's an issue that they run away from and that they don't want to challenge. Um, so there, like I say, two questions about um, the nature of the different progressive, in inverted commas, uh, democratic candidates and their social basis and the one on uh, identity politics. Thank you. Excellent questions that demonstrate a deep familiarity with American politics. The Democrats have always had uh, politicians like Bernie or Elon Omar from Minneapolis. Minneapolis is a very liberal city. Ilan Omar, and it has the largest Somali population in the country. And that's the base of Ilan Omar. We work in that community in Minneapolis. We have a significant branch there. We work in defense of Somali immigrants who have been framed up as terrorists and face a lifetime imprisonment. And in that, we run into Ilan Omar where we build United Front massive demonstrations and defense committees in defense of the victims of capitalist oppression. But Ilan Omar is a Democrat. She just ran in a primary where the Democratic Party establishment in Minnesota backed her opponent, a non-entity black politician who came from a corporation with a corporate background who had no record to do anything. Uh, of anything progressive. So Ilan Omar trounced him and was reelected to Congress. We didn't support her election because she's a Democrat. We have never in our entire history supported 
a Democrat, no matter whether, and we always say if Lenin ran as a Democrat, we wouldn't support him, uh, which is the case. If Jeremy Corbyn ran as a left-wing reformist Labor Party person, we would support him critically and make our criticisms known. So for us, it's a matter of principle. I have, I just turned 80 years old, and that's pretty darn old, but I have to say, it gives me some experience in lesser evil politics. From the day I entered the movement, I was told by the lesser evilists that we had to support Lyndon Bain Johnson to stop Barry Goldwater, who was a fascist. We had to support this candidate to stop the fascist Nixon. We had to support whatever it was to stop the fascist George Bush. There's always another fascist looming in order to drive the unwary. And there are always a layer of stalking horses that the Democrats put forward. But both Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and Elon Omar and other progressive Democrats who they call the gang united to support every Democrat in the country in, 19, in 2016. Not just the right wing of the Democrats, uh, not just the left wing, but the right wing. And there is no, quote, left wing other than those who pose as Democrats, as, as liberals, in order to channel people back into the framework of the Democratic Party. So um, we don't think the Democratic Party can be reformed. And the day we begin picking out the chosen candidates like Elon Omar or uh, Ocasio-Cortez is the road to hell. As we say, it's paved with good intentions. But sadly, there are strong currents in the United States or formerly strong currents like the Communist Party who constantly support the Democrats. Need I mention that they supported Lyndon Johnson who promised that he would never send American boys to fight in Vietnam. And yet we killed four million Vietnamese in what was known as Johnson's War. And every organization on the left in order to stop the fascist, quote, fascist Goldwater, supported LBJ. Even the SDS at that time, Students for a Democratic Society, championed the slogan, part of the way with LBJ. Whereas four years later, Johnson was incapable of walking down the streets of the United States. People chanted, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Thousands, tens of thousands, I think 67,000 American boys died, a majority Black and Latino in the war, and four million people were slaughtered. And the illusions that Johnson was a liberal. Johnson was the classic Southern racist, bigot, Texas Democrat that was the chosen vice presidential candidate of JFK, the Northern liberal. He was in the race in alliance with Kennedy in order to sheep herd the racist segregationist wing of the Democratic Party in 1964 into the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was formed as the party of the American slaveocracy. The Democratic Party was the party with the Klan and the White Citizens Council that smashed Reconstruction, that established Jim Crow laws, and the Democrats are tied to it. They ran Al Gore for president against Bush because B Gore's father, Al Gore Sr., was an open segregationist in the South. And the same with Jimmy Carter, who they turned from a segregationist school board member who opposed, uh, who organized school busing to take white kids past black schools so they didn't have to attend them. Jimmy Carter was a right wing of the Democratic Party, and they posed him as a liberal civil rights hero. He was another despicable example of capitalist politics. They play this game because they have control of the media, the corporate uh, institutions, and a sad, deep layer of radicals coming out of the Stalinist communist parties, or today its remnants, and other social democratic organizations that have for their entire existence supported the Democrats, including the DSA. The DSA had an unbroken 
record since its formation, probably 40 years ago, of support to every Democrat. So uh, that's the key question. Now, on identity politics, you're right. Uh, we reject the idea that, um, which is popular in the United States, that posing oneself as a, uh, a Black or a Latinx or as a uh, uh, LGBTQI uh, person, as opposed to the so-called uh, white male racist older comrades, is the road to destruction. That's what we saw in the ISO. The International Socialist Organization was by far the largest organization in the United States, claiming perhaps 2,000 members. And all of a sudden, a formation appeared that charged the leadership of the ISO with covering up rape. And they operated with the proposition that anyone charged with rape had to be assumed guilty. But the people who were charged were charged by non-members who refused to appear in San Diego before the branch to write charges or testimony. So the ISO said, what can we do? Can we throw them out because someone unknown, never filing written charges, who refused to appear? And in fact, it was only her boyfriend, an ex-ISO, who leveled the charges. So a group in the ISO formed a uh, anti-rapist type current. Another group turned up and said that the group was inherently racist because they live in a race society. So they formed a black organization, another formed a Latino organization, an LGBT caucus in the party. And in the end, all of these, quote, opposition caucuses united, won a majority, expelled or censored the majority, took over the leadership of the ISO, and then within weeks it was discovered that among this group they had their own accusers of, of, uh, of rape and sexism and homophobia. And the result, they called a common meeting and dissolved the largest organization literally overnight. And where did it go? it went into the DSA and Bernie Sanders campaign. So in our party, we start with the proposition as a revolutionary party, a revolutionary socialist party, that we do not accede to charges that we are inherently racist or sexist or homophobic because we are invariably connected or born into the racist, sexist, homophobic policies of the United States. We treat all of our comrades equally. We don't have caucuses in the party to fight the leadership, which are accused of being inherently racist because they're white, inherently sexist because they're men, inherently homophobic because they're straight. We have a united party. In the class struggle, we seek to unite the millions. But we see increasingly an organization come up and say, uh, well, we're black, we want to take over this anti-war coalition, we want all the votes. And the result is that more often than not, that claim black organization is affiliated with the Democratic Party, takes over the platform and touts Democratic Party speakers in the name of being a black-led organization. We see less and less of this in the Black Lives Matter movement because to the amazement of all of us, millions of white young people came into the street and stood side by side with their black sisters and brothers, with their LGBT sisters and brothers, with their Latino sisters and brothers. So we think we seek to build united class struggle formations that unite the entire working class, as opposed to identity politics that counterpose one group, one race, one gender preference, one sexual orientation, one nationality against another, on the grounds that each of the accused is guilty of inherent racism and sexism. So we see it. You know, I was a founder of the national movement to free Mumia Abu Jamal 30 years ago. We built a united movement of everyone. 
And I remember attending one meeting, and forgive me for going on on this, where a, a black member looked at us all and said, uh, we can't continue this mobilization to free Mumia until we have all of the white participants attend my class where they can purge themselves of racist and racism. Otherwise, we'll never free Mumia. And they put it to a meeting of 30 people. And uh, they accused every white in the room, most of whom had spent a lifetime in the anti-racist movement, including people like Robbie Mirpool, who was the son of the executed Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. <laughs> they implied that he and all kinds of political people were inherently racist because we're white. And I remember standing up at that meeting and saying to that person who subsequently passed, I have no intention of attending your class to rid myself of racism. I and my party and my comrades have spent a lifetime fighting racism. I was arrested nine times and in prison for fighting racism. I was blacklisted because of my politics and my record. And I was a founder and friend of Mumia Abu Jamal and remain so today. I have no intention of attending your class to rid myself of racism. At that point, Pam Africa, who was the founder and organizer of the International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu Jamal, sort of ended the discussion. She said, anybody who wants to attend the class can do it, but right now we're going back to business. We're building a united movement. So I don't have much truck with uh, identity politics. That is, with small groups of people accusing the rest of the movement of being inherently because they are white or straight or old, being backward racist and so on. We need to build a united movement that is free from attacking each other as opposed to attacking the ruling class that is the real perpetrator of racism and sexism and homophobia. That's my view. I don't know how widely understood or accepted it is in, uh, in Ireland, but I hope we have some common grounds here. All right, so, yeah, yeah just, uh, just uh, we're coming up, we sort of went beyond the hour, so I really want to bring the meeting to a conclusion. So I'll take one more contribution from Dave, and then I'll ask Jeff to come back for a summary. So go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's important, isn't it? Decades of experience in uh, our struggle. It's really important. It, it gives some people a certain amount of wisdom. I want to make a couple of points and ask a question. Um, I, I, I happen to agree with just about, just about everything you said. And the big problem with Corbynism was that it focused on, despite the 400,000 new members it brought into the party, um, such as me. I mean, I joined the party in 61, but left over Blair and Iraq, etc. And hundreds of thousands of people like me, socialists who had been out of the party, new young people came in. But the focus was on electoralism, as you, as you quite rightly say. Um, and compare that with the Black Lives Matter. Um, I've been going on demonstrations in my city, Brighton, city of quarter of a million, since the, since the 60s, since I was a boy. The Black Lives Matter demo a few weeks ago, thousands strong, the biggest demo ever, ever in, in Brighton. And it was so good to see black, white, et cetera. Um, and it made me think of uh, when we were fighting the National Front in the 1970s. But there's a difference. In the 1970s, we were chanting, black and white, unite and fight, smash the National Front. But the level of political understanding amongst those, and it's our job as a vanguard to, to develop that political understanding. The lack of political understanding about the relationship of, of capitalism to racism was pretty much absent. One other point, and then I'll get onto the question, if you don't mind. Um, secondly, anti-Semitism. Anti the comrades, that is to say, Marxists and socialists, we always knew, it was so obviously blatantly um, uh, a, a con, a con trick by the oh. Israeli could you excuse me for a second? I have to take an emergency call and I'll be right with you. Please yeah, forgive okay. me. 
Well, it's good to see you all. Shame there's not more people here, but uh, there's so many Zoom meetings, aren't there? I hope he didn't leave because of my, what I was saying. No, Are you I'm there, here. John? I Are was, you there, John? I'm here, yes. I was, yeah. very, I was very pleased uh, to hear Jeff sort of sum up the basis of action, which is solidarity. I think he did it very well, and I think uh, you know, certainly the left, we're, we're getting severely criticised by another American group for um, for raising questions about uh, in, uh, intersectionality and uh, and uh, gender gender spectrum issues, you know. And uh, I I actually think that's quite an important issue. I think Jeff explained the position well, and, and so did you to a certain extent around the the fight against fascism in. Uh, in Britain, and uh, it seems to me that uh, because there's more action on the streets, there's also people on the left are sort of shaking this days of identity out of their system. You know? right. right, Jack, you're back. I'm sorry, you were you were talking about Corbyn and anti-Semitism, and I interrupted you. I That's have okay, a, Jeff. I have a, I have a special I, education son, and when he calls an emergency, I have to take the call. Forgive me. Sure, sure. Okay, so anti-Semitism. We all knew on the left it was just a con trick. Um, he is the most humble, <laughs> honest, full of integrity, but weak, weak. He didn't confront. He didn't confront. He didn't stand up strong. The left, the Marxists, the socialists in the party, we, we did, and we got ex we gradually getting expelled for it. Anyway, I'll, I'll cut to the question because we're coming to the end of the meeting. And you might have covered this. What I'm engaged in in Britain, in the Labour Left Alliance, we've got about 2,500 members, um, is attempting to get the, the left parties together. I know you talked about focusing on the trade unions, I have friends in the CPUSA, I have very close comrades in PSL, Party of Social Administration. Now, it might seem fantastical, fantastical to suggest a national conference in Britain or the States to bring all these groups together, because we know that some only want to further their own interests as the carriers of the Holy Grail. But I look, and I'll end the question here, I look at the example of uh, don't burst out laughing or fall on the floor uh, of Syriza and Antasia in Greece. And I was active in Greek politics for about 10 years, uh, just for a few weeks every year, but getting tear gassed in Syntagma Square, etc. And there, there was a, uh, a, a federal organization, individual membership. Um, no one party was dominant. It was in Syriza, which was the problem. Um, so let's move from Syriza and its betrayal of the 2015 uh, referendum result. Let's move to Antasia, which never does particularly well at the ballot box. But it, 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 it does bring together people from different traditions, Stalinist, Maoist, Trotskyist, um, etc. And I think when I look at Britain, and I know less about the USA, um, and this is the question, um, is there any hope of the left parties, as well as the left movements, the left trade unions, um, pop-up unions, etc. Is there any hope or moves to actually bring about a coalescence, uh, a, a united front? 